um, Dr. Elaine Blakemore talking on characteristics of boys and girls toys. Thank you. I want to try to force myself in the beginning here to stick to my text a little bit so that I can talk about some of the introductory research that's been done on the topic of boys and girls toys. And then I'm going to be presenting two studies that were done here at IPFW. They are published at this point, and I'll be looking at some of the tables in the published articles. But about six or seven IPFW psychology majors helped with this research and were uh, really integrally involved in it. Um, so what I want to start um, by doing is looking at kind of the characteristics of boys and girls toys as we know from the research. It certainly is assumed that toys play an important role in young children's lives. That children use them uh, for pretend play, to develop cognitive skills and so on. And so people would want to know, developmental psychologists included, and I am a developmental psychologist, uh, how toys might impact children's development. What are sort of um, good quality toys, not so good quality toys, what are the implications of toys for children's development. And interestingly, there's actually not a lot of research on that question, how playing with particular kinds of toys might have an impact. Um, it's also the case that people who study gender development, which is what I study, uh, have a long history of using toys as a marker of children's gender development. So there are many measures in which children are asked, what toys do you like, as sort of an indicator of whether or how their development, gender development is progressing. Not so much individually, but in general. Uh, when do, do little children know that toys are for boys and for girls? And at what age do they decide <laughs> that they like the particular kinds that are associated with their gender? But when researchers have done that kind of work, they've often sort of arbitrarily chosen the boys and girls toys. And note that I'm always putting quotes around that because I don't want to imply that they are only for boys and girls, but rather they're stereotypically <laughs> considered for boys and girls. But when researchers have chosen sometimes two or three, sometimes only one boys toy and girls toy, they've just arbitrarily done so. Uh, they've gone out and gotten a truck and a doll, for example, or a football and um, a Barbie or something like that. And I certainly wondered how do they know that those two or three toys that they've chosen are equally masculine and feminine. How do you know, for example, that a Barbie doll is as feminine a toy as a car is masculine a toy? And that's certainly one of the key questions that this program of research was looking at. Um, there certainly has been in the 20th century, and some in the 21st as well, uh, but looking back kind of at what developmental psychologists did to look at boys and girls toys, we can uh, look at Rheingold and Cook's study, which is really the only study that actually went to the bedrooms of boys and girls, um, an appropriate number of both boys and girls, um, and counted and categorized the toys that children had in their rooms. And then they came to some conclusions about what those toys were. So these were one to six-year-old um, boys and girls. Um, they found that boys and girls had the same number of books, musical items, stuffed animals, and furniture, but boys had a greater variety of toys. This is really an interesting aspect of boys and girls toys, that there are more different categories, and you'll see that in the research that we're doing here as well. Um, and boys had more toys overall than um, girls did. But there were some differences. Boys, now remember, of course, this was done in the 1970s, boys had more vehicles. Um, toy cars and trucks, but also larger items like wagons and so on. There were 375 vehicles in the boys' rooms that they counted and 17 in the girls. Uh, not one girl had a wagon, bus, boat, kitty car, motorcycle, snowmobile, or trailer in her room. Now this is probably one of the things that has actually changed since 1975 in terms of uh, girls today probably have more vehicles than they did then. But I think it's really clear to, s clear to everybody that boys have a lot more vehicles um, than girls do. 
Boys had more in Ryan Gold and Cook's study. Spatial and temporal toys, that would be things that you would use to build, uh, to sort different kinds of shape sorting things, magnets, outer space toys. They had more sports equipment, uh, more toy animals, garages, machines, military toys, and interestingly, educational and art materials, even though those are generally seen as gender neutral in Ryan Gold and Cook's study, they had more. Uh, girls' rooms had more dolls, dolls' houses, domestic items, sinks, dishes, stoves, brooms, things like that. Uh, and boys almost never had any domestic toys at all. Um, dolls were very common for girls, but they actually had almost, uh, or boys had a number of dolls too, but when you actually looked at the dolls that boys had, uh, remember again this was in the 70s, um, they were things like toy soldiers and so on, and I would say that those were kind of comparable to the action figures that you would see around today, which really aren't the same sort of thing as a doll that you would feed a bottle or diaper or something to. So they, um, so they had cowboys as well as soldiers and so on. Since Ryan Golden Cook, a lot of people um, have done things. Let me make sure that I'm in the right slide. No, I am on the right slide. Um, a lot of people have done things like look to see what kinds of toys children ask for Christmas. So they look in their letters to Santa Claus and so on. And there's several of those studies from the 1970s really up into the 21st century. And consistently they show that girls receive and request more clothing, jewelry, dolls, domestic and musical items, and boys receive and request more sports equipment, vehicles, military toys and guns, and more spatial and temporal equipment. So there's several different studies looking at that. There's an interesting finding that children ask for more gender stereotype toys than parents spontaneously provide. So parents are more likely to provide things toward the more neutral end, like the educational materials, puzzles, and so on. Whereas when children write these letters to Santa or make their Christmas list, they're more gender stereotyped than parents are. So it's clearly the case that kids want to have these kinds of gender stereotyped toys. Why they want to is another issue entirely. Um, there are also lots and lots of studies because toys are used as a marker of gender development at looking at what children's toy preferences are and at what ages those preferences develop and so on. So there's a whole host of that kind of research. All right. Um, since boys and girls do play with different toys, people are interested in what, in general, the characteristics of those toys are. So how could you characterize boys and girls' toys? And you could certainly probably come up with some of those characteristics, but the purpose of the research that I'm going to talk to you about today is actually looking at what those characteristics are. Uh, from the whole range of very strongly masculine to very strongly feminine and neutral toys in the middle. Uh, in 1987, Miller uh, did, I think, the first study that systematically looked at the characteristics of boys and girls' toys. And after 1987, until mine was published in 2005, nobody else systematically looked at the characteristics of boys and girls' toys in, in a systematic way. Um, what she did is um, have, she selected, I think it was 50 toys, um, and had them rated by undergraduates on a series of different scales. I'm not going to worry too much about Miller's scales because I duplicated all of her scales and put a whole bunch more in. Um, she was interested in things like could the toy be used for symbolic play? Would you use it for fantasy? Uh, is it about reality? Um, can you use it to express nurturance? Does it encourage aggression? A whole host of characteristics of that nature. Um, and she found a series of differences that I just sort of want to cover really briefly. But the interest, uh, one of the interesting things is what kind of fantasy play you can um, take part in with stereotypical boys and girls toys. And if you think about it, the fantasy play that you can engage in with stereotypical masculine toys is way removed from everyday life. It's things like, oh, you can take two WWF figures and bang them together, for example. There's certainly a lot of aggression that can be associated um, with fantasy play with boys' toys. 
Or you can get into a spaceship and fly off into some outer galaxy. Whereas, to put it very bluntly, the fantasy play you can engage in with stereotypic girls' toys is ironing um, and sweeping. And as well as the nurturant play that one engages in with baby dolls. Um, it's also the case, just kind of a side comment, uh, a lot of the dolls that girls play with today are not baby dolls. They're in the category of what's called fashion dolls, and I'll have a lot more to say about that later, but you're not feeding a bottle and diapering a fashion doll. Okay. Um, she found in her study that boys' toys were rated <laughs> higher on sociability, permitting play with others as opposed to alone. Uh, as we will get to my study, we'll find I did not replicate that. So I think that it could have been the particular set of toys that she used. Um, girls were rated higher in creativity, manipulability. I didn't replicate that either. Nurturance and attractiveness. Uh, with boys, toys also competitiveness, aggressiveness, and constructiveness. And I'll have more to say about those sorts of things as well. Um, since then, there have been a few um, both specula speculations um, as well as a, a few content analysis of boys and girls toys and I want to just mention them briefly. Jean D Block, who is a very important gender developmental researcher in uh, through the middle part of the 20th century into the late 20th century, she passed away some years ago. She made the hypothesis, but I don't think anybody systematically studied it, but I always thought it was a really interesting hypothesis that boys' toys respond to input more. That is, you do something and the toy does something in response. And the example that I have up there is a slot car racer where you've got this little controlling device and you have to use it slow or fast and make sure that the car stays on the track and goes around, but you're doing something and it's responding to you in some way, which would be an important characteristic of toys to give you a sense of you control things that happen. Um, so she suggested that that was the case. To, in today's world, uh, video games would be in that category, which have been overwhelmingly marketed to and uh, to boys, and boys have shown much more interest in video games. I'm not going to talk about video games today, except for this little comment right now. Uh, I chose not to study them in this particular study because there's actually a lot of research on video games that compared to the amount of research on toys otherwise, um, there's just a ton of research on the implications of video games in um, a couple of different areas in both responsiveness, uh, developing icons, which is sort of a visual representation of something, as well as aggression and violence, and spatial skills. So there's a bunch of different areas of research on video games. But she had that interesting suggestion. Um, and then I cited Klugman in 1999, in which she looked at how Barbie dolls and action figures were designed and marketed. And I'm just going to sort of go through the specifics of it. So she was looking at Barbie dolls and then um, action figures of a bunch of different categories, the sort of um, G.I. Joe and WWF and things like that, and pointed out that action figure play often involves fighting, where you sort of bang them together. Um, they come with weapons. They come with instructions on how to use those weapons. Whereas fashion dolls, the other category that she was looking at, like Barbies, um, have a lot of appearance-related items with them, combs, brushes. You can get a big Barbie doll head and put makeup on it and do its hair up in a variety of different ways and so on. Uh, action figures, um, joints are mobile. You can move their arms and legs and other parts of their bodies, whereas Barbie dolls can only be moved sort of at the neck and the hip. You, don't, you can't do the same degree of mobility with one as the other. Uh, the packages that contain them, she noted, are different. Um, action figures themselves hardly ever have pictures of boys on the box. They just have a picture of the figure. And the figure has weapons, and it's got words like kill and destroy on the box. Uh, whereas on the girls' boxes of Barbie dolls, um, there's pictures of girls quite often playing with the dolls, uh, using combs and whatnot to interact with them, um, and pastel colors as opposed to bright colors on, on the boys' marketing and so on. Um, 
so we're going to, what I think the contrast clearly is, is between aggression and violence on the one hand in those kinds of toys and, and a focus on appearance on, in the other kinds of toys. Uh, and we'll see that again. So what study did, what did I do here? Okay, so I'm <coughs> just going to stick all this up. These are, it's sort of a summary of uh, what I've said already. Um, in this study, in this series of research, I did two studies. Uh, and they're just studies of college students, um, and that doesn't necessarily imply that um, children's behavior would be impacted by these characteristics, because you have to actually have to look at children's behavior to see if they're impacted by toys. But in order to do it, you kind of have to know what the toys are and what their characteristics are first. So that was the purpose of this program of research, was to look at um, all kinds of different toys and characterize them as masculine or feminine, and then look at their characteristics. So in the first study, we measured the extent to which people thought toys were for boys and girls. And I'm going to give you an example of them and how we did it. And in the second, we looked at characteristics of four categories of toys, strongly masculine, moderately masculine, neutral, moderately feminine, and strongly feminine. So we're not looking just at what are boys' toys like compared to girls' toys, but what are really boys' toys like compared to sort of boys' toys, sort of neutral toys, and so on. Um, OK, so in the first study, I want to talk a little bit uh, about what we did to start with. And um, there were, I think, maybe four or five undergraduate IPFW students involved in this research. And what we did to start with, they did and I did, was find samples of every single kind of toy we possibly could. Uh, they, two of them were parents, so they had toys in their home. Uh, they went out to toy stores and they took pictures of things and they wrote down names of toys and we went to the internet and we used advertisements and toy catalogs and so on. So we just uh, amassed a whole bunch of toys. We started, we ended up with 275 color pictures of toys. So we started with these 275 toys. And what we did next is then categorize them. And we categorized them into 27 different categories. And then I want to the, I want to jump to the actual. So try to ignore this on the right hand side. <laughs> Just look at the left-hand side. Um, and here are the 27 categories. And so what we did is just take these 20, 275 toys and figure out what they belonged into. And then when we had those categories, we chose exemplars of the category. So rather than use all 275 toys, because a lot of them were sort of duplicative of each other, we used them all to come up with the categories, the 27 categories, action figures, dolls, makeup, building and construction, musical equipment, and so on, weapons. Uh, and then we came up with exemplars that we thought um, reflected those categories. So we ended up with 100 and some, how many was it? Um, 126. So we started with 275 toys, and we pared it down to 126 so that they represented all of these different categories. Then we had approximately 300 um, elementary psychology students. I want to make sure that I have the right one to hand out. Um, rate these toys on a nine-point scale. And the nine-point scale went from, on the one side, toy is only for boys, to point five, toy could be for either, um, to point nine, toy is only for girls. It might have been reversed. It might have been one for girls and nine for boys. But you get the general idea. And what I'm going to hand around, or I'll just hold it up and then hand it around, is the pictures of the 126 toys were handed out to each participant in the research. They have these color pictures of all the different toys. And then they have a computer answer sheet. And for each one, they have to rate toys only for boys, toys only for girls, or somewhere in the middle on the nine-point scale. So what we're doing with this is trying to find out how strongly masculine or feminine people see these toys as. Now, you might ask yourself, do children see them the same way as adults? And you, you're going to have to take my word for it. But there's lots of research that shows that children do, that children uh, somewhere are between two and three, and certainly by four or five, 
um, know very well what toys are culturally categorized for boys and girls. You might also ask the question, is it similar historically and across cultures? And to some extent, um, not all of that information is certainly in. But if you look historically, uh, girls have had baby dolls for centuries and centuries, and boys have had toy soldiers for centuries and centuries. So those general categories certainly have existed for a, for a very long time. But there's lots of toys today that didn't exist in historical time and don't, don't belong in a variety of other cultures in the world. Uh, but Western cultures tend to have the same sorts of um, toys across the world now because there's so much sort of mass marketing of all of it. So we have these 126 toys and they are ranked from this toy is only for girls and I don't want to see it anywhere near a boy to this toy girls should not be touching. So that's essentially what this did. So I'll hand this around and you can take a look at it through the room but I think you get the general gist uh, of what was going on. Okay so let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so 292 undergraduates rated them um, and selected from the pool of 275 in the 27 different categories. Uh, lots, the pictures that are on the PowerPoint are generally pictures of the toys that were used in these two studies, although sometimes uh, I threw in another picture that I got at a later time, but for the most part they are. Um, so we're going to take a look at table one here, which is again back in the published article. The, I thought about trying to put this table into, um, it, that actually should be table two. Um, I tried to put this in the PowerPoint, but it's so long it goes down. You can see that it starts here. Let's see if I can close this. Why can't I? <laughs> So it starts here on um, 622 and moves all the way down to halfway through 623. But what I want to do is, sorry, <laughs> oh great, and let's go back to 100%, um, is have you look at least a little bit of what's at the top and what's at the bottom, because you're not going to be able to look at these 126 toys and figure out where they're all rated. But Strongly feminine toys, this is a nine point scale. What you should be able to see over here is, so clearly feminine was one and masculine was nine. So the most feminine of all of these toys was the ballerina costume. And the second most feminine, the large Barbie doll and accessories, head and accessories, anything related to Barbie dolls near the top, uh, makeup and so on. And you start moving down sort of toward the middle of the scale, which is 5.0. Um, you see, and we broke these into f five categories. So it just kind of arbitrarily, but it's sort of in the middle of the scale where we did. So these are the really strongly feminine toys. And again, you can see what they are. Sometimes the particular ratings might have been affected by the color of the toy, a tea set. Um, in very pinkish sorts of colors is likely to be seen as more feminine than if it looks kind of sturdy and it's red and blue. Um, moderately feminine toys here. And neutral toys, Candyland, Cash Register, Winnie the Pooh, karaoke machines, doctor kits, stu a lot of stuffed animals, tricycle. Moving down to moderately masculine toys. Um, guitars, tents, bug collections, and so on. Uh, airports, Lincoln Logs, a lot of building things showing up in moderately masculine toys. And if we go down to the very end of strongly masculine toys, what you're seeing is um, fighting, weapons, G.I. Joe, uh, this transformer did have weapons associated with it. You, I don't know if you remember what a transformer is, but it's like you make something out, you make a person out of a car sort of thing, but they usually have weapons and stuff with it. Um, toy soldiers, WWF, and a ring for WWF. And again, this is then coming up toward the nine on the nine point scale. So that gives you an idea of what the toys were, and that's what we did in the first study. Okay, so I want to go back to the PowerPoint. Um, 
All right. When I when using the ratings of these toys, then as I said already, we identified five categories: strongly feminine, moderately feminine, neutral, moderately masculine, strongly masculine. And then what we did from those ratings is create four toy sets. Right here is an example of one of the toy sets. Um, and each of these toy sets had 15 toys in them, three in this category, three in this category, three in this category, three in this category, and three in this. But we had four different ones of these toy sets. And Part of the reason that's important is if for study two, we're looking at how these toys are categorized. And if you're just using three toys that are strongly masculine, what happens when you rate them on other kinds of measures, which we'll see us doing in a moment, you could just be affected by these particular toys. So in study two, I used four different toy sets. So all together, there would be 12 strongly masculine toys, and some people would rate these three, and some other people would rate another three, and some other people would rate another three, and other people would rate the other three. So you're not necessarily tied into what the particular toys were um, to the same degree if, as if you only used one toy set. So we had five. Okay, so now, um, 700 um, Psych 120 students participated in this study, and about 170 to 180 people rated each toy set. And what they rated them on was 26 scales. Um, and those 26 scales are written there. Um, so effectively, we have the next measure. Um, each person would get one of these toy sets. And the one I'm handing around, I think, is the one that was on the slide before. But they would just get one, and there would be on this 12 toys, no, 15 toys. And what they would then do is rate each toy. So what you can see here is a, some crayons. And on this five-point scale, tell me whether you think this is able to be manipulated, encourages creativity, encourages social play with other children, encourages nurturance, etc., requires adult supervision, is fun, exciting, moves on its own. Uh, you know, that issue of responding to the child's input. So every single toy, they would have to sit there and do these 26 scales on toy one. And then go on to toy two, and do the 26 scales on toy two, and then go on to toy three until they were done with all 15 toys having rated, this takes a lot of answer sheets, by the way, uh, rated all of the toys, all 15 toys on their toy set on all 26 scales. Um, so what study two then does is shows you how strongly masculine strongly feminine, moderately masculine, moderately feminine, and neutral toys are characterized in terms of the characteristics on these 26 scales. Um, okay, let's look at table four. Okay. I had, by the way, a bunch of hypotheses tying them back to the literature and so on, and I didn't want to like belabor all of those today, but there were appropriate hy hypotheses in there. Um, okay, those are the four toy sets, but I wanted table four. We're not going to look at this for more than a second because it would just drive you crazy. But uh, strongly feminine toys were averaged across all four toy sets. So you're looking at toy set one, two, three, and four averaged. Um, and look at a scale like able to be manipulated, strongly feminine, moderately feminine, neutral, moderately masculine, and strongly masculine. And what I think you can actually see with able to be manipulated, this is a five point scale from not at all to very much. So five would be very much and three would be not at all. So you're looking at a sort of hovering around I mean, not three wouldn't be not at all, three would be moderate, and one would be not at all. Uh, you're looking at all categories um, 
people saw these toys as moderately able to be manipulated. In other words, kind of no difference, essentially, is, and we'll see that when I do a summary, a summary of the different categories. Now back to this. Um, okay, so what I want to do is look at a few scales here. Um, I, wanna, I have two different slides here. If you look at nurturance, we're looking at strongly feminine here, moderately feminine, neutral, moderately masculine, and strongly masculine. And nurturance is the blue bar. So what you essentially see is the two feminine categories. This is the midpoint of the scale, so it's sort of moderate. Um, the two feminine categories are kind of high on nurturance relative to everything else. And all the others are kind of the same, except strongly masculine is really not. Okay, so one on this scale would be not at all nurturant. Um, I don't really see how a WWF figure could be nurturant, but nevertheless, maybe just a little bit. Um, appearance, this scale is, there's actually two appearance-related scales. Um, one is, does the toy encourage you to think about appearance or focus on the appearance of the toy? Uh, like Barbie doll would be an appearance-related toy, if you want to think of it kind of conceptually. And what you see with appearance is strongly feminine toys rated higher than any other category, and that's the way the statistics turned out as well. So you could say one of the characteristics of strongly feminine toys is they focus on appearance. Um, artistic, does the toy itself, the other appearance scale is in the next slide and I'll comment on it when I get there. Um, artistic is, does the toy encourage artistic skill, develop artistic skills, does it look like something that an artist might use, for example. And what you should see here, I think, is that neutral toys were the toys that were thought to be most artistic. Educational, um, here's educational and we're looking at neutral and moderately masculine. Whereas strongly feminine, especially strongly masculine, toys are not seen as very um, educational. Scientific is kind of interesting because you might think, well, boys' toys might be a little more scientific. Um, but what you see is that scientific gets more and higher and higher and higher going from strongly feminine through moderately masculine and then drops way down again. Swords, toy soldiers, guns, and so on are not necessarily scientific. Um, aggression, does the toy encourage aggression? Here's strongly feminine, neutral, moderately masculine, and bingo. Um, aggression is associated with strongly masculine toys. Uh, we've got some more. The second attractive scale is just a rating of do you think the toy is attractive to look at uh, as opposed to does it encourage a focus on being attractive or appearance. And what you see here is they're kind of all sort of attractive to look at but strongly feminine toys higher than others. Uh, does it move on its own? One of the things that um, I didn't actually do in my introduction, even though it's written in there, is that there's some research showing that other primate species, uh, juveniles of other primate species, like boys and girls' toys in the stereotypical direction, and clearly they're not being socialized there. Uh, the toys that are typically used are vehicles and dolls. So vervet monkeys, for example, is a species where juvenile male vervet monkeys prefer cars. Um, more than juvenile female vervet monkeys do, and juvenile male uh, female monkeys prefer baby dolls more than juvenile male vervet monkeys. So one of the things that people have asked about that is, well, why in God's earth uh, would a male monkey like a car? And in fact, if you want to even look at toys from an evolutionary perspective, why would human children uh, boy children like cars too because you know we didn't have cars through very much of human evolution mm -hmm. and the hypothesis has been that it moves on its own that what they're attracted to is movement um, and when and vehicles move and so that again is one of the scales that we used for rating and what you see here is um, those were rated relatively low across the board but moderately masculine toys higher than others, and that's where the vehicles tended to fall in moderately masculine toys. Some fell here, um, so those are a little higher. There's enough power here to get a statistically significant difference there. Um, but I wouldn't say that scale says, woo, boys' toys move on their own. I would say 
more toys that move on their own kind of fall into that category. It doesn't seem to be a big part of masculine toys. Uh, does the toy need adult supervision? That would give you the impression that it was maybe sort of dangerous and not so for the girls' toys. But you see kind of this higher for neutral but moderately masculine seeming perhaps more dangerous and then strongly masculine are kind of up there too, but so is neutral. Um, and that's kind of, trampoline was in that category and so it might have actually pushed it up a little bit, wagon, bicycle, that sort of thing. Um, okay, artistic, did I put that on the last slide too? Um, is it exciting? And here you're seeing neutral and moderately and strongly masculine toys. And then that question of whether the toy responds to the child's input. And here, kind of all of them do sort of a little, but you're seeing neutral and moderately masculine being higher in that category than others. So again, it's hard to take Gene Block's recommendation that boys' toys respond to children's input more than other categories to do unless you're looking at moderately masculine toys, but neutral toys are up there too. So, um, so what I'm going to do here is summarize, um, looking at these 26 scales, sort of some of the take-home messages for the characteristics of boys and girls' toys. Um, strongly feminine toys tended to be rated high on physical appearance and attractiveness and were themselves seen as attractive. Uh, I'm not putting every single scale here, but just kind of the big take-home message <laughs> high points. Uh, and consistently rated on all, low on all <laughs> measures, as being associated with the development of intellectual skills, cognitive skills, um, being educational, spatial. We didn't really have a measure of spatial skills. We had a couple of different measures, and I'll talk about them in, in a second. Um, moderately and strongly feminine toys, equally so focusing on nurturance and domestic skills. Um, interestingly, I found that this interesting, that moderately feminine toys were not otherwise characterized. In other words, there's nothing that held that category together differently than all the other categories, whereas that isn't true for any other category. And I think it's sort of related to this question of the, do boys have more different kinds of toys? What the moderately feminine ones were sort of things like this. Um, which aren't focusing on appearance and attractiveness, so on, but um, some of the strongly feminine toys were in that general category too, so it was really hard to differentiate moderately feminine toys. Uh, and then I have a cartoon here before we go on to the other slides. Um, question of <laughs> the parent who is trying not to buy a Barbie for her daughter. Um, can you all read that? Uh, okay, it says, understand that you are not to compare yourself in any way, nor feel like you should aspire. And the little kid does realize that, oh, finally, she's getting a Barbie. It says, I've caved over here. Um, there is actually some research, there's so little research on the impact of toys, but there really is actually a little bit on Barbie dolls and perception of appearance um, and a tie to eating disorders. Um, with very small children, like preschoolers, um, following, giving them Barbie dolls and following them a little while and showing kind of an increase in bad feelings about what they look like. Um, and not so when they gave them a comparable plus size fashion doll. There's a plus size fashion doll called Emmy. I don't know how plus the doll really is, but nevertheless. Um, <laughs> it's, Emmy is a plus size model um, and so the Emmy fashion doll is based on sort of more realistic proportions um, but given how unrealistic the body proportions are of Barbies, Emmy is kind of like just more real um, and not so ridiculous. Okay, so for boys toys, the, for strongly masculine toys, violence and aggression, competition, <laughs> danger, risk, and also consistently rated as being unlikely to develop cognitive skill or be educational or anything of that nature. And I think one of the take home messages of both strongly masculine and strongly feminine toys is clearly they are very gender stereotyped in what they focus on on these two issues of appearance and aggression. But neither one of them seem to be the sort of toys that would stimulate um, 
cognitive or intellectual skill if one was interested in that in their children. Um, moderately and strongly masculine toys, a little bit more moves on its own, exciting, sustains <coughs> attention. Um, this is, to me, the interesting category. And they did hang together in a variety of different ways. Um, moderately masculine and neutral toys showed up highest on all of those measures of intellectual, cognitively stimulating, uh, provides a response to the child's input. In parentheses, I have here uh, what the actual sort of what we call post hoc tests are, which you, some, some of you might know what that means, but the statistical test afterwards to see whether or not they were different. Uh, moderately masculine and neutral or equal. Involves construction. Uh, this might be a question of um, developing spatial skills. A lot, a lot of people think that construction toys, Legos, blocks, and so on, um, might develop spatial skills. There's also a hypothesis that toys in, that involve movement, tracking of movement, also move on their own, might be a spatial skill related issue. Here, moderately masculine were higher than neutral, but these two categories uh, were very, very similar. Needs adult supervision, moderately masculine, a little bit higher than neutral and strongly masculine, which are equal to each other. Scientific, um, what are the scientific toys? I really think the answer is moderately masculine toys are the scientific toys. Um, develops cognitive or intellectual ability, neutral a little bit higher than moderately masculine, but those two up at the top. Educational, neutral a little higher than moderately masculine, but again up at the top. Develops physical skills, same thing. So if you're looking at all of those, sort of desirable if you like, that's a value judgment, but anyway, um, characteristics of toys, this was the category where you found, or these two categories were the ones where you found them. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to read this slide, so I will read it for you. Um, if I can even, s and I can't even figure out what the kid's name is, but she's asking him, do you find me exciting? Um, and then she wanders to the table, but Miss Caucus, I don't like blocks. I want to play with my doll. Uh, come on, Jenny, give it a try for me, okay? Okay, what should I make? Uh, anything, anything you like. So uh, sh Jenny sits down and makes this huge castle um, and sighs as she's finishing it. Ah, uh, Miss Caucus, this is obviously an old Doonesbury. Uh, this is boring. I want to play with my doll. All right. Um, dear, you did give it a fair chance. Oh, goody, she gets to leave the blocks and go play with her dog. So clearly there's some element uh, that this is suggesting that there's some element of children choosing their own toys. And I said in the beginning they certainly do, but the question of why they do I think is an open question. Um, neutral toys, cognitively stimulating and educational, encourage physical skill, artistic skill, musical skill, creative occupational skills, and fun. Um, and so that's what hung together the category of neutral. Um, no differences, equally expensive, equally able to be manipulated, encourages cooperation, although strongly feminine, lower than everything else, encourages social play, although strongly masculine, higher than everything else. Uh, but by and large, there's a whole bunch of characteristics of boys and girls' toys that really don't differ from one another. Um, and I'm just going to go through this really fast, put it all up. Um, it's very clear that even today, boys and girls' toys are very strongly stereotyped. Ma masculine and feminine toys are. Uh, and they are predictably related to gender-related traits. Um, this is, again, a value judgment, but if you look at very strongly stereotyped toys, one might argue that there are some really undesirable traits associated with both, in both strongly masculine and strongly feminine toys. Um, educational are the moderately stereotyped, but especially moderately masculine. Some years ago, a researcher stated, um, looking at just sort of it, the general characteristics of boys and girls' toys, the boys' toys were better toys in the sense of if you want to use toys to stimulate children's development, to encourage them um, to develop um, intellectual, cognitive skills, and so on. The boys have these more different categories, uh, but that overall, as encouraging appropriate developmental milestones, accomplishments, and so on, the boys' toys are better toys. Um, 
I don't think that that could be said about strongly masculine toys, but it's quite reasonable to say that about moderately masculine toys, but also neutral toys fall into that category as well. So um, given that that statement was made before there was a lot of research looking at the characteristics of boys and girls toys, it doesn't seem like a reasonable statement to me, uh, looking at the moderate ones. Um, from my perspective, from the researcher perspective, there's, one, there's a couple of really important um, things about this research. It's um, clearly got its limitations, and I'm well aware of what they are. But from a researcher's perspective, if you want to develop stimulus materials and you want to have uh, in your study toys for children that are equivalently masculine and feminine, then you can use the ratings to pick four or five or six or more toys in the different categories and know that they are equivalent in their degree of masculinity and femininity rather than randomly picking a Barbie doll and a football um, which might not be equivalently masculine and feminine. So that to me um, was an important goal of what I was trying to do which was a goal for researchers not a goal necessarily to understand developmental processes. And then it was important to me that there were four different toy sets and that the ratings of their characteristics were not tied to just one single set of toys. Given how hard it is to rate all that many toys, it would be impossible to ask a single individual to do more than 15 toys worth of ratings, but yet I wanted to make sure that they weren't tied to those specific toys. Okay, and that's where the article is published. Uh, and I'm done. Ooh, good. <laughs> all right, you bet. Um, I have a four-year-old son and an eight-year-old daughter, and they would rather play with each other's toys. Mm -hmm. It actually drives me absolutely batty. So is this, is this curiosity? Is this sibling rivalry? Because like my girl won't be playing with anything, mm -hmm. and my son will go play with what it is she, she that's a girl's toy, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden she wants to play with it, and it becomes a fight. Right, and it could be more about that than it could be about the interest in kind of something different. There is actually research looking at sort of the degree to which children are gender stereotyped depending on sibling configurations in the family. Um, and what it basically finds is that having an older brother is the largest impact on um, gender development of the younger sibling, and both younger brothers and younger sisters are more masculinized by an older brother. Uh, older sisters, actually, younger brothers of older sisters tend to be even more masculine than average, and part of the reason for that seems to be uh, kind of a reaction to the denigration of the feminine. Like, but in your particular case, it just could be, it belongs to her, so I want to bug her, and not about the gender characters. when she's not even around. If she's okay. gone, he'll He'll change a diaper on a baby doll, or he'll... Uh, Isn't that wonderful? I mean, but, I mean, but he's still very, very much a boy. Anybody yeah. who's been around him knows that. Yeah, but, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's just interesting to me. And she'd rather play with his Transformer at times. Mm -hmm. I mean... And one of the neat things about having kids of, of both genders is the greater exposure they get to a variety of different kinds of toys, that if you only have two boys in your house, if you yourself as a parent are fairly stereotyped, then that's going to be a restricted range of what those kids have access to. It's also in the, peer, in the adolescent years, they get more interactions with peers of the other gender if they have siblings of the other gender because their siblings bring kids home. So it's kind of a neat family configuration thing. You had your um, hand. In your study, did you look at the gender of the participants at all? Yes, I did. Um, and it's in the article. <laughs> but by and large, in both studies, uh, males and females rated the toys and their characteristics very similarly. There were a few instances where there were differences and where those instances were were kind of predictable but if you're looking in the first study where we had 126 toys I think the differences between males and females were on three or four toys and they were all in the direction of females shifting more toward neutral and males shifting more toward stereotyped on the rating of the toy um, but very very few in the second study uh, general characteristics like fun uh, women thought girls toys feminine toys were more fun than males thought than men thought girls toys were but they equally thought that boys toys were fun 
and so that that's an example of a difference but the similarities were overwhelming relative to the differences but in fact when you publish the article you do analyze that and present the data and so on so, so. Previ did you see it in a previous study in both of in you mean in previous research yeah that was published by the only one that would have been published doing such ratings was miller's and i actually don't remember whether miller had such a set of findings yeah it's very consistent that women are more liberal about gender, just in, incredibly so. The, from the age of about two and a half, uh, little girls are more liberal on gender-related issues than little boys are, and it carries through throughout adulthood. So, still now, yeah. Um, yeah I'm sure you probably said this. I, I just can't remember. Um, everyone who who rated all the toys, but that was those were students. They were all college students. And I and, and let me answer. Let me say something about it first, okay? Because uh, in IPFW, at IPFW, about 25% of the student body are parents, and so. In both studies, somewhere from 20 to 25 percent were themselves parents. I also had them in the second study rate how frequently they were around children. And 80 percent were higher than three on the five-point scale that I'm regularly around kids. Now, I know I interrupted you. You get it. No, you no, get a turn. That's part of it. But it wasn't so yeah. much the whether or not you're a parent, but, but just how, how you know, old you are. You know, yes. Like age. Yeah. So it's mostly we're looking at the 20s. Um, the range of age, and we're not allowed to use participants younger than 18, even if they're in our subject pools, but so the bottom range of age is 18, um, and the highest was in the low 50s. Um, the mean age in both studies would have been in the low 20s. Um, but again, we do have a lot of people, because many of them are not residential, most of our students are not residential, we do have a lot of parents, yeah. and we have a lot of people who are living near their families and see nieces and nephews on a regular basis. <laughs> Thank you uh, for a really informative talk. I was just wondering what, um, if there have been any studies done on, I guess what I would call the Bratz doll effect on human girls. Bratz dolls are um, despicable um, uh, girls that uh, the dolls that look like tarts. I've um, seen them, yeah. And, oh, and I even have some pictures in here. Anyway, yeah. I think that's why Mattel came up with those, because uh -huh. they're finding that um, girls, that young girls were abandoning Barbies at a much Earlier yes, age. that's right. So yeah. They made brass dolls to, to try to stretch it out and spend a whole or uh, buy a whole set. bunch more toys. Yeah, exactly, but they're they're really um, I, I think much more um, insidious than uh, than the brass. So <laughs> you're acting like you think they're sort of creepy. They are. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> um, however, there's so little research on the impact of toys generally, yeah. and there is, as I said, some on Barbies. There's certainly a lot of of hypotheses or sort of essays written about the, which is different than actually studying the impact. But I've seen nothing on the Bratz dolls at all. Well, still a good yeah. kind of uh, yeah. there Yeah, clearly toy marketers are not interested in gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. They're interested in people buying stuff. And so, well, if they're interested in gender stereotypes, it's only to market better. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, how parents are more likely to buy in neutral that kids themselves right. choose, yes. Would you say that has to do with the parents uh, wanting to get their kids away from these values of the, or uh, just want more education? I think it's mainly because those toys are educational. Uh, there is variability in the extent to which parents want to espouse gender-related okay. values. And there's, in fact, research on different kinds of say family attitudes there there are parents who are liberal on gender parents who are very conservative and um, there are families in which they absolutely want their children to adopt gender related activities behaviors toys appearance all of that sort of stuff and other families where they don't care so much about it and other families where they are actively trying to get their children not to adopt gender related characteristics so there's huge amount of variability the ones who are actively trying to get them not to are fighting the whole rest of the culture which is trying to get them to um, and so but there clearly is variability there but my sense of why that is is the educational issue that you want them to do art and music and all that hmm? Barbie's not a nice girl. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm giving her <laughs> And there she was on yeah. that scale of not wanting her kids to conform to that. 
I, I didn't want my kids to have guns, and, and we had this um, program to get one of my kids to, we used a behavior modification program, and I stupidly said, and when you've got all these stickers, you can get whatever toy you want. <laughs> and guess what that was? <laughs> anyway, yeah? Do you have any explanation uh, about why a pink cheap would be seen as a feminine, a strong feminine toy rather than a masculine toy that happens to be pink? Um, in this culture, and it's really interesting to know that at the turn of the 20th century, people have a really hard time believing this. Pink was associated with boys and blue with girls. At like, yeah, people just like, oh, can't be pink is for girls. Uh, but there was, in fact, a different set of associations. Now, and, and in most of the 20th century also, I mean, it shifted. I'm not even sure when it shifted, um, but in some early portion of the 20th century, in certain cultures, Western cultures, uh, pink is very, so associated with girls that even if parents have a second child that's a boy and the pink blanket sleeper doesn't have any holes in it and you could use it for your boy, it creeps people out and it, it lo does largely because of homophobia. They're like afraid that putting the pink blanket sleeper on will turn this boy into a homosexual, uh, which on the face of it is just ludicrous, <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, but it clearly is a cultural association with femininity. Thank you, Dr.